رحم الله من قرا الفاتحه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Just reminding ourselves of certain things that we have stated before we go into today's lecture Now if you remember we had stated that the lengthy prelude and the conceptual work was only done in order to address certain issues that are a problem with the community and community practice or have become facts and facets in the face of religion where they are not making sense. Either they are leading to stagnation or have become counterproductive. And so back to basic means going back to the essence of what the Prophet had taught. And that essence of the Prophet was self-realization. Self-realization, in other words, was acqu acqu acquisition of spiritual morality. Spiritual morality was for us to become godlike. There is that beauty within us, the yearning to find itself. And that process is brought to a completion through religion. And therefore, religion is an expression of God-human relation, in which God marks the absolute completion. And God marks the intimate process towards that completion. And the completion is for the human being to acquire the fullness of themselves and become godlike and mirror that truth, that beautiful truth that is vested within them, due to which the angels were prostrating in front of Adam, due to which Allah has said, ruhi, When I breathe into him of my spirit, the whole process is that religion is a means to actualizing that beauty. Now in that process we stated, back to basic means that which is not intuitive. By intuition we meant that which is inconsistent with the growth property, which is self-realization through self-liberation self and self-realization. And in that process, the ahkam we stated were a means towards an end. In that we made further distinctions. We stated that the Prophet has stated, the Qur'an is a heavy weight that I leave with you. The Ahlul Bayt are heavy weight that I leave with you, but in contrast to the Qur'an, they are lighter weight. Why did he say that? Because the Qur'an is contextual. We explained that yesterday. Yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very meticulously has given a form. In that form, the essence is quite apparent and left a mechanism, dynamism within that form for the form to renew itself. However, when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt, they are far more restricted within their context. What does that mean? That the context of human beings as they change, the Ahlul Bayt will give different forms. But at all point, the reversion is to the Quran because it's less contextual. So when in conflict, the Quran will supersede, not only in form, but in theology in morality, in spirituality. Then we made another distinction. 
We talked of private practice and public practice. We stated that provided an act does not need to be hidden away, it's not frowned upon, we are not ashamed of it, and we cannot explain it away. Provided an act fits these criteria, that it is not something we are ashamed of or we can't explain it away, then it is possible that the act can be public or private practice. In that we suggested that Imam Sadiq Salamullah in public never stated <laughs> never stated Aliyun Waliullah, so in a private practice we can do that. And in private practice we can explain it away theologically and jurisprudentially, provided we can explain it away. But in public practice, if my Imam did not do something, who is that mastered, by the way? When it comes to this sixth Imam, Aristotle looks like a child, yes? This is how grand his knowledge base is. When my Imam did not do something in the, private, in the public practice, what right do I have to be more Imam than the Imam? The sixth Imam was asked, how does it feel being such a grand Imam? He stated, for me to be called a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib means more to me than to be an Imam of the Muslims. If that Imam had a public practice, then we too should learn something from that public practice. But provided that that practice is and can be explained and reasoned with. Then, I'm just reminding ourselves because we need all these preludes. Then we spoke of inno innovations and bid'a. We stated that a very narrow definition of bid'a was anything that is given the color of religion and ordained in the name of God, which is not from God. That is the narrowest sense of bid'a. However, the Quran praises bid'a in certain instances like priesthood, monasteries, so on and so forth. So we then work towards a greater definition of bid'a. What was that? Any practice, culture that stifles the community or brings it in a state of regression, that is the bid'a that has been frowned upon. Otherwise, the Prophet said, if somebody leaves behind a good practice, they will have its reward and the reward of anybody who adheres to it. So bid'ah in essence provided it is not attributing a practice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something to be frowned upon until and unless it conflicts with the growth property. Is that coming through? So the public practice, private practice was in line with individual cultures and universal cultures. The Quran and Ahlul Bayt were in line with the theory of context and less context, more contextualized, and less contextualized, more universal. And bid'ah was in line with directly the growth property. If we've understood all of this, then we're going to a very, very major theme today. Something that is the charm of the faith, and something that is also marking the downfall of the faith. God's centricity is the absolute goal that we need to achieve. We need to become God-like. We have stated that, the vertical line. Everything is a means towards this central essence. Everything. Even the Prophet is designated as a means. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبَعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ If you love Allah, follow my example, Allah will love you. It is you, your love for Allah. It is Allah, Allah's love for you. I am a mere intermediary. My example will make you eligible for the love of God. Why? Because you will increase the receptivity of the flow of God within yourself. You will understand and acquire a righteous way of existence where God will shower his mercy upon you and bring you to the fullness of your own existence. Verses upon verses of the Quran, they are removing every prophet from the story of salvation. In that surah we find, in surah Nisa, that the Jews were boasting upon the Christians and the Muslims that we are the first of the Abrahamic faiths. The Christians were boasting and saying, we have the immaculate conception. The Muslims were saying, we have the final prophet. Allah responds, Laysa bi wala bi ahlil kitab. It's not your wishful thinking or Muslims, neither the wishful thinking of the people of the book. He 
who believes in Allah and does righteous from man or woman will have their reward. Finish is cut off the whole story. He says there's nothing to do with Judaism, Christianity or Islam. It is you and your God. The rest of it is a form. The essence is you and your God. You arrive to your God by directing yourself in that religious explanation of the centrality of God and human where God marks the utmost completion towards which we aspire and God is the process towards completion. If that is assured, you have your salvation. Verse upon verse upon verse removes Christianity, Judaism, Islam from the central theme of salvation. It says, no, the central theme of salvation is what? Your godly connection, righteous deeds, and working towards God. That has been the essence forever. You become godly. And in that process, everything is an intermediary. Even Islam as a religion, lock, stock, and barrel is an intermediary. What he's trying to say here, what we explained, in the second or third lecture was the whole process of spiritual morality that the truth of my existence is within me there is nothing else i am the beginning and the end of the truth there is no truth beyond me can you see this when i'm not here the world functions when i die the world will function anyway when you bury me you will extract this ring from my finger what have i left with from this world what have I taken with me? Open my grave after a year. You will not even see this hand there anymore. It will have decayed. It will have gone back to dust. So what was my story about anyway? I have come into this brilliant universe. So meticulously organized. Before I came here, the sun was already placed there. The moon was already there. The meteorite had struck the earth to give it water. There was atmosphere. There was gravity, there was plants, there was animals. Everything was done for me. I merely came here. What was my purpose? To eat, drink, acquire wealth, sleep and die? Is that all? There was a phenomenal purpose for me. The phenomenal purpose for me was to find my own self. There is nothing but godliness inside me and inside you. That has been the central purpose for everyone. For us to arrive at the fullness of ourselves and begin to resemble the beauty of God that is awaiting reception within us. Doesn't Hussein ibn Ali say, Ma wajada man faqadak, wa ma faqada man wajadak. In his Dua Arafah, those epic statements of Hussein, O Lord, what has he found, the one who has lost you? And what has he lost, the one who has found you? Doesn't Hussein again say in Dua Arafah, O Lord, at this point now I understand that your sole purpose from my own life and existence was to introduce yourself to me through every relation and through every circumstance. For you to disclose yourself to me when my mother looked upon me compassionately, it was the glance of you, O oh my Lord, that was looking at me through the eyes of my mother. When my father protected me, it was your protection being given to me through the form of my father. When my brother gave me undying support, O oh Lord, it was you who was supporting me through my brother. When my friend gives me unconditional love and acceptance and accepts me as I am, it was your introduction through my friend. It was only you, O oh Lord. It was a story between me and between you. It's always been that story. Everything else was secondary. Now, when people say follow the prophet and the model of the prophet, the Muslims, they eat with three fingers. They walk with short steps. They sleep on their right hand side. This is what the Muslims have learned from the prophet. But the real beauty of the prophet escapes all of their minds. The real conduct of the prophet was what? When he lost something, he said it was Allah's anyway. When he gained something, he says, Oh Lord, you have given it to me momentarily. When he faced enemy, he said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. When he faced a heavy task, he said, Tawakkaltu ala Allah. When he had nobody, he said, Hasbi Allah. Look at the Prophet. That was the real trait of the Prophet. The real conduct of the Prophet that the Muslim was supposed to learn in line with the vertical axis and in line with the centrality of God. 
the prophet, it is said this, listen to this as we remind ourselves, if today I go beyond my time, forgive me. This is what we are told, that the prophet prayed outside the Kaaba, Abu Jahl, threw the intestines of a camel upon him. The prophet hadn't eaten for three days. The heavens trembled. Jibrail came down. He said, Ya Rasulullah, God cannot withstand your state of loneliness. He cannot withstand your state of hunger, of poverty, of not having anybody by your side. Allah gives you the keys to the treasuries of the heavens. Take whatever you want. Eat as much as you want. Rejoice. Have the best of this life. Take the armies of the heavens and destroy your enemies. Vanquish them and rejoice. And he will still give you the reward he has stored for you in poverty. Tears rolled down the eyes of the prophet and he said, Jibrail, take them away. On the day in which he gives me a morsel, I shall thank him. On the day in which he deprives me of a morsel, I shall bear with patience. Why did the prophet say that? He said, O oh Lord, don't make me rely upon my abilities even for the blinking of an eye so that I may forget you. Always impress upon me that I am nothing and I am fully dependent to you. I don't want the treasuries of the heavens and the earth. I want you, O oh my Lord. For the greatest beauty of the Prophet was within the Prophet. Not in the paradise of, of, the, of, of God. There's this beautiful hadith and because it's of a spiritual nature, I'll state this hadith. That in the hadith of Ma'raj, Allah says to the Prophet, O Prophet, O Muhammad, when the best of my creatures die, they are brought to me in the blinking of an eye. In front of me they stand and they tremble in my awe. I say, O soul, inform me of what has happened in the world. And it says, O Lord, ever since I have awoken to you, I have done nothing but tremble in the awe of your majesty and melted away in the splendor of your beauty. I reply to it, O Muhammad, that indeed you speak the truth. I swear by my might, I shall keep you in a place where there is no veil between me and between you. Not even the veil of paradise. Not even the unending gardens, the brides, the rivers. For all of them are less than what is owed to you, O soul. Imagine, if the paradise is created by a single ray of God's beauty, then what God must be like. Imagine. That is the true reward for the son of Adam. That is the true treasure that awaits him. Now, <coughs> if this is understood, let us go into today's topic, which is hugely important. It is so relevant, and it is also the downfall. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear in the Quran. He says to the Prophet, tell them, قُلْ لَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ عِنْدِي خَزَائِنُ اللَّهِ وَلَا أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبُ وَلَا أَقُولُ عِنْدِي إن وَلَا أَقُولُ إِنِّي مَلَكُ Say, Muhammad, tell them, I do not tell you that I have the treasures of, this, treasures of God. I do not know the hidden. I am not an angel. Then the Prophet says again, If I knew the unseen, I would have gotten every good and no evil would have befallen me. Allah is so particular to tell the Prophet, to tell his community that. Why? Because there was a huge possibility that after him the people would say he knew everything. And they would be distracted from God and God's centricity. And they would put somebody else between them and between God. Whereas God has been denying any relation between him and the human being. He was saying it's directly you and me. Nobody else. But at other points God says, he does not give his hidden knowledge save to those that he is pleased with amongst his messengers. But he is categorically clear in the Quran that Prophet tell them this. Imam Ali is going towards the mosque in Kufa. In the morning, on the morning of the 19th of Ramadan, Hassan runs behind him. He says, Father, I see you in a state of anxiety. He explains his dream. He said, Oh Father, if that is the case, 
do not proceed to the mosque. The Imam looked at him and he recited the verses of Surah Luqman. La tadri nafsun mada taksibu ghada. Wa la tadri nafsun fi ayyi ardin tamut. No soul knows what it will earn tomorrow. And no soul knows in which land it shall be killed. He said, Oh Hassan, I do not know the decree of God. Go back to your place of resting and let me go to my own, attend to my own duty. The Imams were humble. They knew very, very well the limits of God and their own limits. Imam Ali Ali was on horseback. The Persians ran behind him. He turned back and he said, what are you doing? They said, this is how we treat our kings. He had tears in his eyes. He said, I am a slave of God. Do not do this for me. The people used to stand for the Prophet of Islam. He used to get angry at them. He said, look, I am no king. I am a humble slave of God. Don't do this for me. Don't give me any of these uh, gestures. God is so particular in the Quran to say that, look, it is only Allah and your relationship between you and your Allah. Don't put any intermediaries between me and you. He says in the Quran, it does not befit any messenger that I have given knowledge to, to say to the people that worship me instead of Allah. And then he talks about the angels, that if any one of these angels were to say that I am your Lord, we will burn them and chastise them in the pit of hell. God is extremely particular about how he wants us to relate to him. Very, very particular. Now, within this group, our madha, there is so much theology, so much theology, which is so inconsistent with the ethos of the Quran. It is so inconsistent that it doesn't make sense. There is such a lot attributed to the Prophet and the Imam, whereas the Quran is saying one thing, the Prophet and the Imams are saying totally different, and the group is saying something third. The Prophet and the Imams are saying, look, these are the boundaries. The Quran is saying this is the boundary, but the group has transgressed and crossed every boundary. And they attribute things to their Prophet and the Imams, things that do not make sense and things that are counterproductive. Now let us talk about one thing before we go into this. In Zarat Ashura, after the Zarat Ashura, before, after the 10, 100, 100 Tasbihs, you know, think about this. Please think about this. The word follows Allahumma lan awwal, wa thani, wa thalith, wa rabi, wa yazid khamisa. Curse the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and Yazid is the fifth one. Yes? Do you really think that the sixth Imam would say something? like this, and then endanger the lives of his followers down the history? Do you think the sixth imam would ever say something like this? And so I can argue that it might have been his private practice. I will say even in his private practice, he would not do something like this. Imam Hussein writes a letter to the people of Basra, and he says to them what? That look, the first three Khalifas have done wrong. By not giving Ali his right, which is true, because the Bani Umayyah themselves set up a court and they said, yes, the first three Khalifas did wrong. Our Sunni brothers, intellectuals, they're all saying, yes, the Khalifas did wrong, but fine, it's all done. But Imam Hussein says, they did wrong, but we still commend them to Allah for, ever right, for whatever right they tried to do. Think about it. Do you think Imam Sadiq would ever say something like this that would then endanger the lives of the followers of Imam Sadiq? That would create such a huge friction within their community? The answer is no. They would not. And is it not a historical fact that Abu Bakr was the first Khalifa of the Muslims? Umar was the second, Uthman was the third, Ali was the fourth. And our Sunni brothers, they do not in Khulafai Rashidin, they believe of Imam Hassan as well. They believe in Imam Hassan as well as the rightly guided Khalif. But they say because the period of his Khilafah was so small, we couple it with Imam Ali's period of Khilafah. But where has the group gone? In the name of the Imam. What are they doing? Something that the Imams have never done. And where does their legitimacy, legitimacy come from? Where does it come from? Something that's so absurdly inconsistent with what the Imams were teaching. Then, the group reads du'as that are totally inconsistent. Look, 
do I come here? What a phenomenal dua. The eloquency. The way the Imam articulates himself. The intensity of meaning. And the befitting expression all at once. Only Ali could do that in extempore. Phenomenal. That's an Imam for you. I say often to myself that I don't really need a proof that the Prophet is the Prophet. I just look at his character and I would say, this is the Prophet. If he's not the Prophet, who's the Prophet? I do not need proof that Ali ibn Abi Talib is a divine guide. Just looking at Ali ibn Abi Talib, his conduct, his character, you know this is a giant of a man. And had it not been for Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would have peaked all human individuals in history of humanity, the most glorious human, but in front of the Prophet of Islam, he appears to become dwarfed and like a child. This is how Grand Muhammad Rasulullah's example is. And you look at the knowledge base of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the man who describes the origination of the solar system in the context of the Milky Way 1,400 years ago, how can a man do that? You say the conduct of Ali, the principles of Ali, the spirituality of Ali, the knowledge base of Ali is what makes Ali, Ali. You don't need to look anywhere else. When you look at Hassan, when you look at Hussein, when you look at their morality, when you look at their knowledge, when you look at the spirituality, you don't need anything else. These are the Imams. Your intellect and heart submits to their authority helplessly. When you look at Bakir, when you look at Sadiq, all of them are gems. We don't need anybody to prove that they are Imams or not. Just read about them objectively. So you look at Komail, it's phenomenal. You look at Sabah, Munajat of uh, Imam Ali. You look at Dua Arafah. Look at Sayyidah Sajjadiya. But if you look at all these beautiful duas, and I want to talk more about it as we go inside it today. Where do you find Ya Aba Abdullah in these duas? Where do you find Ya Abal, Ya, ya Abal Hassan, Ya Ali in all of these duas? Where do you find them? Do you find them anywhere? If the person who is most eligible to say Ya Hussein and Ya Aba Abdullah, it should have been Imam Sajjad, right? Look at this Sahifa from beginning till the end. What is it? It's God-centered. It's God-centric. Look at every dua. The one who was most eligible to say these things was the son of Hussein. He did not say it. The one most eligible to say this was Hussein himself. He did not say it. The one most eligible to say this was Ali Salamullah Alayhi. He did not say it. Where is it coming from? Today, the group has a tasbih. In which they're going to sajda and they say, Ya Fatima tu aghithini. O oh, Fatima, assist me. When did Imam Sadiq say this, please? When did Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein say this? Even the private practice, public practice does not work here. Even in private practice, this cannot be explained. The sixth Imam, the ziyarah of Imam Hussein, And then praise a dua after two rakat salah. What does he say? Allahumma raka'tu laka wa sajadtu lak. Oh Lord, I've done ruku for you and I've done sajda, sajda for you. Because ruku and sajda cannot be for anybody but you. This is a divine guide telling us. How can we go into sajda and do something like this? And then when you look at dua al-kama, grammatically it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have that eloquency. And the way... The content is, you know for a fact that those masters of words, those masters of spiritual and moral expression, how can those masters have said something like this that is inconsistent, even Arabic, the Arabic of it is inconsistent. And then we have Ya Aba Abdullah and then Ya Abul Hassan. It's totally unlike any imam to say this. But the group holds it as a core of its identity. And such spirituality has become the flagship and the banner of the group. Where did any of our Imam say anything in those authentic duas of theirs that resembles anything like this? As I said, it's going to be a little bit challenging, right? Salawat. Certain of these practices cannot even be defended cannot even be defended in the equation of private practice and public practice. Because even in private practice, they become inconsistent with the sort of essence of religion 
that the Quran, the Prophet and the Imams are giving us of this beautiful, direct connection with Allah and God's centricity. Even in that, you can't explain. Then, we have the whole of this idea of tawassul. Yes? First and foremost, find me which Imam read Dwai tawassul. Now, tawassul in essence is accurate. Salman went to the grave of the Prophet and he said, Ya Muhammad, istasqi la ummatik, when there was a drought. He said, Oh Muhammad, seek water for your ummah. They went to Aisha. Aisha said, There is a dome on the grave of the Prophet, break it. And when the blessings of the grave of the Prophet goes to the heaven, it will shower. It happened in that way, as Aisha had said it. But which Imam recited Dua Tawassul, find it? You will not find it. Because if the sixth Imam recited it, the twelfth Imam hadn't come till then, right? Which Imam recited it? <laughs> None of them. So I'm saying, okay, Dua Tawassul, in essence, it is fine. In principle, it is fine. But why should it be a public practice for the group? Why should they go on top of the roof of the Kaaba and recite this dua? When the people who are onlookers, they get a very wrong message of the religion of Imam Sadiq. Why can't that practice, why can't that dua be done in private practice, in a private capacity? And then, when somebody questions, to theologically explain to them the validity of this dua in private practice. And then again, look at the amount of amals we do in the month of Ramadan. You know, we in, in the UK, we fast for 20 hours. People like me, I end up fasting for 21 hours, yes? And that's because you don't know me any better. Otherwise, you would, have, you would have seen the sarcasm of this comment, but never mind. So now, in those four hours that you have left, right, what do you do? You eat, you drink, you pray namaz, you go to your families. What are you supposed to do? The amal are so many, it takes six hours to finish the amal. What is happening? And people are doing amal upon amal. And if you check the amal, they're all repetitive. The duas are repetitive, but we have to repeat it because Sheikh Abbas Kumi has quoted them. Do you know what has happened historically? The first imam did this. The second imam did this. The third imam did this. The fourth imam did this. The fifth imam did this. But what he doesn't mention is that the first imam did not do what the second imam did. And the fourth imam did not do what the third imam did. And the seventh imam did not do what the first six imam did. He just improvised. But we have to do every single thing that all the prophet and the twelve, uh, twelve imams have done. And there is no sense in there. What was dua meant to be? It was meant to be the most beautiful point of God-human connection. The imams improvised. Ali ibn Abi Talib was responding to the divine manifestations that were occurring in his heart. And he was responding to them through his beautiful words. He says to Lord, look at this dua. And that dua is Ali's dua, not my dua. But when I relate to it, it becomes my dua. My dua is my personal connection with my Lord. Yes? I'm supposed to explore my Lord from every angle. Sometimes, as a human, I have to be true to my humanity and not pretentious. Sometimes I say to Allah, O Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth. O Lord, the most charitable. O Lord, who never asks before giving. O Lord, who never prevents me even if I disobey you. O Lord, who sustains me in the womb of my mother. O Lord, shall you ab abandon me in today when I need you the most? Sometimes I speak to my God in this way. Sometimes I say to my God, O Lord, your slave appears before you. You are my master. Sustain me. Give me what I want. Sometimes I go to the Lord and I say, O Lord, are you not more merciful than my own mother? Is my mother not a mere ray of your beauty? If I had gone to her, she would have immediately given me whatever I wanted. Will you not do the same for me? Sometimes I go to my Lord as a friend. I say, oh Lord, I share this pain with you. Who else do I have to share it with? Sometimes I go to my Lord in defiance. Oh Lord, it is my right upon you because you are my God. Which other door is open for me to turn to? Do you want me to associate others with you? Sometimes I say to my Lord, oh Lord, but you know how helpless I am. Or sometimes as Ali ibn Abi Talib says to his Lord, he says, oh Lord, yes. The flames of the hell are unbearable. I know. 
But, O Lord, will you be able to hear my cries and to see my pitiful state? That is what is hurting me. Because you are my friend. I don't care if the rest of the world has abandoned me. What hurts me is that, is that you are abandoning me. And then he explores another side of this beautiful connection. And he says, O oh Lord, I have loved you so much, so much. It's like me going to my mother. I've done something wrong. And my mother ignores me. And I say to mother, mother, acknowledge me. Swear at me, shout at me, slap me, but acknowledge my existence. For that is most painful for me, that you turn your glances away from me. This is what Ali says. He said, oh Lord, a drop of that chastisement cannot be withstood by heavens and hell. Oh Lord, if I were to bear it, will I be able to bear you turning your glances away from me? This is how he explores that relationship. And then he says, oh Lord, who else do I have but you? Look at the beautiful way in which he improvises. And he is true to his own self and explores this beautiful relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is that beautiful connection. Allah says in the Quran, Qul ibadi anni inni qareeb. Ujibu da'wata da'iya idha da'ani. Say to my slaves that I am near. I respond whenever they ask me. Doesn't Allah say, and those people who believe and do righteous deeds, they are the people whose evil deeds Allah will convert into good deeds. He gives us so much confidence with His self. This was supposed to be the story. Now these beautiful imams explored their personal relationship with Allah. Their du'as are their du'as. They were not pretentious. When I read their du'a, to the extent to which it relates to me, it's my du'a. But otherwise, for me to call out to my Lord in English, Kachi, Gujarati, Urdu, Arabic, when the ah comes from the depth of my heart, that is when my Lord smiles and comes to me. There was a man in the time of Moses saying, Rabbi, 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 Rabbi. The angels were laughing. An angel passed. They said, why do you laugh? He said, at the fate of this man. Why? He said, before he said, Rabbi, once the Lord said, I am here. Why doesn't he have the confidence with his God? But look at us, the way we have become. We read du'as in a very senseless ways. We read the du'a of Ramadan, don't we? وَرَزُقْنِي حَجَّ بَيْتِكَ الْحَرَامِ فِي عَامِ هَادَ وَفِي كُلِّ عَامِ Grant me the hajj of your house in this year and every year and none of us means it. But if I don't mean it, why do I read it? And what cause does a woman have to say and marry me with Hurul Ain in heaven? Why should a woman say that? It's totally unmeaningful. And then the sixth Imam, in his ripe old age, he grabbed hold of his white beard and he said, Harim Shaybati al nar Prevent this white beard from burning in fire. Most of us don't have beards. Which beard are we holding? And then my beard is black sometimes and I hold it as a white beard. Does it make sense? This was something beautiful. It was the success story of the madhab. It has become a failure of the madhab. These duas, this spirituality was supposed to be a direct connection in that vertical axis for us to find our God and open and the Ahlul Bayt and their traditions were supposed to be a means indicating as how we should be very open and pretentious with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What have we done? We have taken the forms as an end within themselves. Now even though we take forms as an end within themselves, if it's like Dua Komail, it's fine. If it is like Dua Sabah, Munajat, Saif Sajjadiyah, Arafat, it's fine. But what have we done? Together with the good, we have taken the senseless that doesn't make sense. We pray Ziyaratul Jami'ah Kabira, don't we? <coughs> In there, we say, Ashhadu anna iyabul khalqi ilaykum wa hisabuhum alaykum. I bear witness, we say to the Imams, that the whole of the creation will come to you and you will put them to account on the Day of Judgment. Where does it say that in the Quran? Where does it say that in the Quran? The ulama, like Sayyid al-Khui, they say, look, it's not an authentic ziyara. 
So why does the group want to recite that ziyara which theologically does not accord with the heavyweight which is the Quran? No imam has said this. No imam has said that I will find me a hadith in which imam says I will do your hisab. Yes, the Prophet said Ali qasimul jannah wan nar and that is true because the lover of Ali goes to paradise and his hater goes to hell. It's true, it's the hadith of the Prophet because Ali symbolizes the righteousness of humanity. But that does not mean that Imam Ali puts them to accounting. That's the job of God. The Prophet said, I don't know what will become of me and what will happen to you. Allah says in the Quran, I will do the hisab. He does not give that leverage to anybody else. So why read things senselessly? And then the people who are not of the group, they point fingers and say, see, these people are doing shirk. But what do you expect? When people go into sajda and take names, when people say, I bear witness that the creation will return to you and then they will be accountable to you, which is totally inconsistent with the Quran. When people say that these people knew lock, stock and barrel of whatever was hidden, the Quran says, I only give hidden to whoever I choose. And Imam Ali says, I don't know where I'm going to die. Look at what the Imams have said. I know. Imam Sadiq, Imam Ali, they would always respond immediately when the question was posed to them. And they would say, the Ruhul Quds assist us as the Ruhul Quds was assisting the prophets. And it will assist the Mu'mineen. But the Ruhul Quds is one thing. And the courtes courtesy with the Quran and the rank of God is another thing altogether. Today, I find people going to Hajj saying that no, you can't pray to God directly. You have to go through Wasila. But Ali ibn Abi Talib is saying in the Dua'i Komail that I make you my Wasila. I make you my Wasila, O my Lord. If Ali is saying this, Salamullah Ali, then what are we to say otherwise? As I said, the Wasila practice is fine. But it should be done in private practice because it's not ordained. And it's not the flagship of the faith. Today, the flagship of the faith and the banner of the faith has become the spiritual rituals and practices. The authentic of it is not done through a right attitude. The inauthentic of it has become the banner of faith and it's counterproductive. A person who follows the prophet of God, Imam Ali and the sons of Imam Ali is the most liberated person. They are the person whose chest is filled with godliness, with the light of God. They understand the purpose of life. They understand the position of the Prophet and the Imams. By Allah, if I were to express my understanding of the Prophet and the Imam, you will all tell me that I'm a mushrik. But there is a level of courtesy that Allah does not allow us to cross. Don't cross those limits of God. If the Prophet is said, if the Prophet is commanded to tell, Qul, la aqulu lakum indi khazainullah, wa la alamul ghaib, wa la aqulu lakum inni malak. Imagine how serious Allah is about this. I do not tell you that I have the treasures of God. I do not know the unseen. I do not tell you I am an angel. If the Prophet is commanded to say these things, then imagine the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving about God's centricity. We will find that even our Sunni brothers are saying this. They're saying to their congregation, rather than reading this Tarawi in which your minds are not there, don't do the Tarawi. Go pray two rakat namaz and spend your time with your wives and your families. All these rituals have become counterproductive. We are doing it for the sake of doing them. They have no essence left in them. Look at Allah. The Prophet said, if somebody smiles at a believer because he loves the believer for the sake of Allah Allah will give him paradise he doesn't require 100 rakat namaz think about this the hadith says if somebody goes to the house of God and removes a dust a piece of garbage from the mosque Allah will expand his grave the hadith says if somebody goes and switches on the light inside the mosque then Allah SWT will bring light into his grave. These little things. What can I do for God anyway? As Hussein says, O Lord, what sort of a God are you? You give me before the need arises. You give me abundantly before I ask you. After giving me, 
you ask me for a loan. With a hard heart, I extend something in your service. With a smile, you accept it. You multiply it over and give it back to me. What can I do for God anyway? Will I feed the creatures that are blind on the tips of the Himalayas with my homes and my zakat? Look at the vast universe of God. Suleiman became so complacent. He said, Lord, let me feed your creatures for a day. A fish opened its mouth and said, Suleiman, feed me. He got his armies of angels, beasts, sorry, jinn, beast and man. Till night, this fish said, I'm still hungry. He fell in humility and in, in prostration. He said, Antar Razak, you are the sustainer. If the great Solomon cannot do anything, what will I do for God? He only expects a little gesture from me. The hadith says, all God asks is for two rakat being prayed properly. The prophet added two more rakat because he knows you will be mindless in the first two rakat. Maybe the third and the fourth might compensate. He only needs two rakats. Then he said he only needs one rakat. Then he said he only needs one sajda. Do it properly. And Allah will give you everything. Why has Allah created everything? The one who can give without losing anything. Why should he not give everything? The only reason he can't give is because I'm not eligible for receiving. It's like a little baby. The instructor says, I want to put you behind the wheel of a plane. But you have to learn how to fly it. This plane is for you. But you have to learn how to fly it. This is what God is saying. It's for you. But you have to learn. Become eligible. You know. I say Allah. Prohibit the fire of hell. Allah says I always extinguish it. You're always rekindling it. Stop lighting the fire of hell. You light it yourself. My job is to put it out anyway. Do you think I've created you to burn you? This human brain. Imagine. Me and you are confined in the 21st century, yet we can gauge the genesis of the universe, the origination of the universe. We know when the sun will explode. How phenomenal is this brain of a human being? Do you think, if I were to create a human being, my God, I would sacrifice the whole universe for that one brain of human being? I would. This is how phenomenal a human being is. Allah says, Imam Ali says in the Dua Kumail, how can I presume that the one who has created me, nurtured me, looked after me so well, has done all of these things just to burn me. How can you do that, O oh God? It does not befit you. If a mother cannot see any harm coming to the child, how can God, the mother of all mothers, do that? The only thing is that the child does harm to his or herself. And the mother says, don't do this harm to yourself, O oh child. The whole essence of what we were being taught was that we become godly and have confidence in our God. And we have totally turned the equation upon its head. The beautiful, authentic duas, which are God-centric, we perform as mere empty forms. And the duas that are not authentic have become the banner of religion. And as a result, the followers of the best of interpretations of religions are the least confident in their own humanity and in their God. Think about this. We go into the narration and we remind ourselves that think of this great Hussein. In his group, he has Christian. Can you imagine? A person who doesn't understand the meaning of Tawheed as expressed by the grandfather of Al-Hussein. He hasn't read the Quran. And that person is there with Imam Hussein. When Wahab goes to his mother, the mother of Wahab, who has been enchanted by the beauty of Hussein, she says, go and give your life for him. Wahab's wife says, take me to your master first. He takes her to Hussein. He says, oh, she says, oh Hussein, I have no one after him. I ask you that after his death, take me into your family. He said, you will be with my sisters and my daughters. She said, I hear that after he gives his life, he will be united with brides in paradise. Take a promise from him that he will wait for me and not forget me. Hussein's eyes became tearful. He acknowledges all of this. 
When Wahab was captured, Umar ibn Sa'd marveled at him. His arms were cut. His head was cut. Umar ibn Sa'd said, throw it back. They threw the head back to the tent of Imam Hussein. Wahab's mother came, looked at the head, grabbed it by its hair and flung it back. And she said, I do not take back what I gave in the way of Hussein. This is the essence of godliness and righteousness in a woman whose heart does not understand but the truth of Hussein. She doesn't understand any prophet, but she's understood the essence of godliness. That Wahab has attained godliness at its peak without going through any of these forms. There is a truth that we need to explore and be critical about ourselves and work back to basics. Tonight is the narration of that child of Hussein who breaks his heart. But I will say this as we go into his narration that he had a great place with Hussein. Great place with Hussein. We find this narration that before Hussein could reach his body Zainab was already wailing upon him. When Hussein approaches him, he says, O oh, good maid of God, who are you to be wailing upon my youthful son in this wilderness where I have no one? She turns to him. She says, It is I, your sister. He quickly grabs hold of her hand and escorts her back to the tents. Why? Sheikh Abbas says, Zainab knew that if Hussein were to witness the wound in the chest of Akbar, Hussein would die with that wound. So she became a veil between Akbar and Hussein in order to save Hussein's life. This is what Akbar means to a father. Can you imagine what that son of Hussein must have meant to his mother? We have this narration in Sham. When the women were allowed to mourn their dead, the heads were demanded by Zainab because they hadn't been buried still. The head of Hussein came. Zainab quickly took it. The head of Abbas came. Umm Kulthum quickly took it. The women of Syria were watching and they saw a head. And the women cried out, O oh Lord, may the mother of this child not be alive. And Leila called out, I am the mother of Akbar. Hussein's tribulations ended after Akbar. But what can we say of those mothers who then witnessed the heads of their sons lifted on the ends of spears? And the soldiers would play with the spears and the heads would fall. It is said, that when Akbar's body came back, Zainab grabbed it. And somebody depicts the sentiment of Hussein. And he says, O oh star of dawn, how short was your life? Such is the duration of the life of the stars that take birth at dawn. O oh moon, how quickly you were eclipsed. Before your time, the eclipse rushed to you and did not allow you to become a full moon. And Hussein's sentiment is depicted in these words. When I speak, O oh child, then your name is first that appears upon my tongue. And when I remain silent, it is you that forever preoccupies my heart. When the friends of Hussein had lost their lives, when only the Hashimites survived, it was decided that they would go into single combat. It was a tradition of war. When the numbers dwindled, they would go into single combat. Hussein came to Akbar. He said, oh child, you shall be the first from me to give your life. Go and seek permission and bid farewell to your mother, to your aunt, to your sisters. Hamid ibn Muslim narrates, I saw the cloth of the door of the tent lift numerous times and fall again. Every time Akbar would decide to leave the tent, the women would fall upon him. 
I wonder how his mother must have looked at him. With what sentiment that he is now going to die. This is the last time I'm seeing my Akbar. I wonder how Sakina must have let him go. We have this narration that Sakina, bewildered, ran to Hussein after the death of Akbar. She said, Father, why are you so grief struck? Where is my brother? He said, he has been killed. She said, oh, beloved Akbar. She began to cry and weep. He said, Sakina, bear it with patience. She said, oh, father, how may I bear this with patience when I see my brother taken away from you and I see my father without his son? How would Sakina be bidding farewell to her Akbar? How is Zainab bidding farewell to her Akbar? Akbar emerges from the tent. The narration is that the cries are following her. There are cries of women that know no end. His mother is looking at him from the tent, longing gazes. He comes to Hussein. He saddles his steed. As he saddles his steed, Hamid ibn Muslim narrates that I heard Hussein cry out aloud for the first time on the day of Ashura. As if a mother is crying at the dead body of her child. He raises his two fingers to the sky and says, Allahumma ishhad ala haula il O Lord, bear witness upon these people. For now I send to them the one who resembles your prophet the most in the way he looks, in his speech, in his behavior, in his character. Whenever our hearts become desirous of looking at the prophet, at your prophet, we take a look at the face of Akbar. O child, go. Go and give your life in the way of Allah. Akbar is going. He hears something behind him. He poses, looks back. Hussein is walking behind him, falling, with his hand on his chest. He said, O oh, father, have you not bid me farewell? He said, Akbar, go, go in the way of Allah. He said, O oh, Father, then what is this that I see? He said, Akbar, had you a child like Akbar, you would not have asked this question. Akbar enters into the battlefield. It is narrated, as they saw him from afar, they said, Allahu Akbar. When he came near, they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Many of them had seen Muhammad the Prophet. They forgot for a moment who it was who was appearing within the battlefield. Akbar came into the battlefield. He said, I am Akbar the son of Hussein. I have come to save my father. O oh, people, unleash your swords against me and see how the youth of Hashimi defends his honor. He kills 120 of them. As Akbar is fighting, Hussein's heart is filled with anguish. He rushes to the tent. He says, Oh Layla, come with me. He said, Oh Layla, pray to Allah. O oh Lord of the camel of Saleh, O oh Lord of Yaqub and Yusuf, bring Akbar of Hussein back to Hussein as you brought Yusuf back to Yaqub. No sooner had she made that dua that Akbar came back to Hussein. He said, Oh Father, the thirst kills me. The weight of the armor has exhausted me. Oh Father, if only I had a sip of water, I would fight your enemy once again. Hussein cried out, Oh child, I do not have even a drop of water to give to you. Oh child, cast aside your male coat of mail. Akbar takes off his armor. Oh child, place your tongue within my mouth. You might find some respite. As Akbar places his tongue in the mouth of Hussein, he retracts it and says, Oh father, you are more thirsty than I. Oh child, Go in the way of God. Akbar, hopeless of life, begins to re-enter the battlefield. 
your grandfather will quench your thirst. Akbar goes into the battlefield, engages with the enemies. The enemies break the rule, surround him. There is Murra bin Munqad, who avows, who says to his companion, by God, I shall inflict such a wound upon this youth that shall rid his father of his life. I said to him, let him be. The people surrounding him will kill him. He said, no, I will do as I have said. He went and hid behind the tree. As Akbar fought, a sword struck upon his head. As the sword struck upon his head, Akbar, unable to contain himself, grabbed the neck of the horse and placed his head upon the mane of the horse. The horse, bewildered, ran wildly. They surrounded him and they started hacking him. Murra bin Munqad, as Akbar is loosening his grip, embeds his spear in the chest of Akbar and tries to lift Akbar with his spear. And the spear breaks and Akbar descends to the ground. And he calls out, O Father, peace be upon you. Hussein says, Wa Aliyah. O oh, Ali, call on to me, for I see not any longer. Hussein is running, falling, standing. He comes to the body of Akbar. Akbar is rubbing his heels upon the dust of Karbala. He looks at Akbar. He says, O oh, Akbar, how insolent these people are in breaking the sanctity of the Messenger of God. O oh, Allah, take revenge from these people. O oh, Akbar, my life has no meaning after you. Then he takes the dust of Karbala and begins to cover his head with it. And he cups the blood oozing from the wounds of Akbar and puts it upon his face. I hear this from the Zakirin. That Akbar is looking at his father. And there are tears in Akbar's eyes. And he says, O oh, father, lament not for me. For this is your grandfather who is quenching my thirst and saying to you, O oh Hussein, hasten to me for I can no longer wait for you. I hear this from the Dakirin that Akbar has his hands placed upon his chest. Hussein says, O oh child, why do you grab your chest? For the sake of Allah, O oh father, do not ask me to remove my hands. O oh, Akbar, remove your hands. As Akbar removes, he sees the broken end of a spear embedded deep within the chest of Akbar. He looks towards the heavens and he says, O oh, Ibrahim, witness how I give my Ismail in the way of Allah. Akbar is rubbing his heels. Hussein cries out, Bismillah wa billah wa fi sabilillah. Akbar, Breathes his last. <coughs> Hussein calls to the sons of Hashim. Help me. I am unable to carry this son of mine. Bring him with me to the tents. As they make way towards the tent. Hamid ibn Muslim narrates. A woman comes out of the tent. She says. Wa akbara. Wa dhayata. Oh for the loss. Oh my child Akbar. She falls on the chest of Akbar. Hussein separates her and escorts her back to the tent. I asked, who is she? I am told this is Zainab. Hussein goes forward and the woman comes bewildered. Ya Sayyidi, oh my master, where is my child? Where is my Akbar? Give me back my child. Humayd asked, who is this? It is, he said, this is Layla, the mother of Akbar. Hussein quickly leaves Akbar, takes and grabs Layla and takes her back to the tent. Sakina approaches him. She said, oh father, where is my brother? Oh child, do not ask of your brother. Allah, la'anatullah al-qawm al-zalimeen. Matumi Hussein.